All right, trying this again. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, Rocketeers. We are back with Liquid Rocket Engines episode nine, and today we have hardware. The very first part of this rocket engine that we actually have like physical parts assembled for is going to be the solenoid banks. A while back, I discussed how to build a valve using electronic motors and gearing you could buy off of McMaster car and all kinds of complicated stuff. But when I did all the math for that, I turned out to not be saving that much money over just buying some nice pneumatic valves, which are actually simpler to use because you can just apply a DC signal of plus or minus 12 volts to open and close them, which is really easy. So I actually switched from those electric valves I designed back in episode five to a set of pneumatic valves I was able to get for cheap off of eBay. And the nice thing about these pneumatic valves is that all I have to do to uh, get them to open and close is to apply air pressure to them from a solenoid. What is a solenoid valve? A solenoid valve is a way of controlling the flow of fluids, be that water, air, helium, nitrogen, something like that, uh, using an electric current. So a solenoid valve uses a coil to generate an electromagnetic field that moves a device through the center of the coil called a poppet. And the poppet is what actually blocks or unblocks an orifice that allows the fluid to flow through it. So if I lose you during the next couple of paragraphs, just think of solenoids as an easy way of going from an electric current to the flow of a working fluid. Now, the solenoid valve poppet is a sliding piece. So in order to get deterministic performance out of the valve, you have to bias it one way or the other. That is, the poppet could inhabit a range of different positions unless you do something to force it into either the fully open or fully closed position. And typically, we do this with a spring. By using a spring to force the poppet to be open or closed when the electricity is off, you can either get it so that when the electricity to the valve is off, the fluid is either flowing or not flowing. And we call these states normally open or normally closed. And you could sort of imagine situations where you want different solenoid valves for different cases. So for example, if you, have a sol uh, if you have a solenoid valve on your tanks to be the vent valve and you lose power and it's a normally open valve, the tanks will vent and you don't even have to do anything. This is really convenient for some scary loss of control situations so that you can make sure that the engine returns to a known state. If you lose power or your computer crashes or something like that, you can always make sure that the rocket engine gets to some known good state. And that makes it a lot safer to work with as well. Now, solenoid valves also get a little more complicated. They come in two-way, three-way, four-way, and five-way configurations. Two-way solenoid valves are easy to understand. That's just you have a pipe that can have a valve in the middle of it, and fluid can either go through it or not go through it. Three-ways are actually way more useful, because with a three-way solenoid valve, you have it so that when uh, you have one common port and then two alternate outlet ports. So when you uh, toggle the power to the valve, it actually switches which port is connected to the solenoid valve. And this is super useful because for some things, uh, like single acting valves that have spring returns, you want the pressure to go away as soon as you stop applying that electric signal. Um, but with a normal two-way solenoid valve, if you just closed it, you'd trap some gas in that tube, and it would have nowhere to escape to unless you added a second solenoid valve. But that adds complexity. So by having a three-way solenoid valve, you can imagine that you have the ability to input gas into a tube and then expel gas from a tube only by alternating a single signal. Four-way solenoid valves are sort of similar in that they take uh, one common leg and you can apply it to one of two outlets, and then both of those two outlets will go to one common vent leg. And so that way you could use it to control a valve that's, say, double acting, where you need to apply pneumatic pressure in both directions to open and close it. And then the five-way solenoid valve is just uh, kind of a fancier version of the uh, four-way solenoid valve, but instead of having one supply going to two outlets, you have two supplies. This way, if uh, you have something that needs different pressures, um, you can kind of work that way. The, the, the five-way is getting just kind of pretty close to just having two solenoid valves next to each other. As it stands right now, I have 10 solenoid valves on the test stand. That's six three-way valves and then two five-way valves. And since each of those five-way valves has two coils, it's kind of like two, two valves times two valves per valve. That's four more valves, so that's 10 total. Let's talk how fluid moves through the system. Our working fluid for this rocket engine is going to be high-pressure nitrogen gas, or for testing purposes, just air. Some fancier rocket engines use helium. It does have some performance advantages, and it is more inert, and it's less likely to have issues with cryogenic fluids like liquid oxygen, but helium is a lot more expensive and kind of rare right now, so we're just going to use nitrogen. So all this nitrogen is initially stored in this 4,500 psi composite overwrapped pressure vessel at the top of the test stand. This pressure then goes through a hand valve, and this just allows me to save the system by closing it, 
and then it goes through a regulator. This drops the pressure down to one of several levels. The pneumatic system I'm using runs at 110 PSI. Even though the tank pressures are a lot higher than that, I have to downregulate the pressure going into the valves because solenoid valves typically don't operate as high of pressure as, say, ball valves do. So after it goes through the regulator to 110 PSI, it flows into the manifold. The manifold allows this single uh, tube connection to supply gas to all of these solenoid valves at once. And there's actually two manifolds, one for the uh, five-way solenoid valves and one for all the three-way solenoid valves. So the five-way solenoid valves are pretty straightforward. They just happen to be the valves for the um, main propellant valves, so both of which are double-acting pneumatic valves. The three-way solenoid valves run a whole assortment of things. The three-way solenoid valves are my press valves, my vent valves, my purge line. They run the uh, hydraulic pump for my open-loop hydraulic system, as well as a few other things. Um, so those systems are also duplicated on the fuel and oxidizer side, so that's what uses up a lot of those three-way solenoid valves on my design. The five-way solenoid valves that control my main propellant valves are called pilot valves, and pilot just kind of means they, they operate the main valve. The main valves are also double-acting valves. This means that they don't automatically return to the state like a normally open or normally closed valve. The five-way solenoids are normally closed, of course, but the main propellant valves themselves require pneumatic pressure both to open and to close. So if the power fails, the main propellant valves will stay in whatever state they were in when the power shut down. So I've been talking about the design of this engine for a long time, and you've seen a couple of parts sneak on, but I really haven't shown off a lot of hardware yet because things have been changing and I've moved and it's been hard to keep things in assembled state, but that's finally changing. The parts we're looking at here were all purchased from a website called Automation Direct. Uh, it was about $700 for all the solenoid valves, manifolds, tubes, and gaskets I was going to need for the project. Uh, so this base part here that's kind of uh, painted a cream color, this is the aluminum manifold. So this allows me to attach all the solenoids to a single pressure supply uh, very easily. And I just uh, use two bolts and a gasket to hold everything together. On one end of the manifold, there's a steam gauge, just so I can double check the pressure, mostly because I don't trust the steam gauge on my regulator uh, to get the right pressure. And then on the other end, I've got a uh, adapter that goes from the NPT port on the manifold to a uh, CGA port that I've connected a paintball regulator into and then a paintball tank, just to serve as a high pressure air supply for this test. To wire up the solenoids, you take off this uh, smoky gray housing on the backside with just a single bolt, and there's three screw terminals you connect some wires into. Uh, two are for powering the solenoid, and one is a shield so that you can limit the amount of EMI interference on the uh, test stand. When you tighten down these nuts right here, it creates a weatherproof seal on the cable. Not that I plan on leaving my test stand outside, but it still seems like good practice to uh, limit the places where flammable liquids can intrude into my expensive test equipment. Now, the wiring for this is very simple. All I have to do is apply 24 volts across two of the wires and the solenoid valve will open. Uh, so that was very easy. Uh, on the rocket engine uh, uh, test stand, I have a uh, specially built uh, printed circuit board assembly that's going to do all the valve control for me. But for the testing, I'm just using a lab bench power supply with 24 volts on it. To connect the solenoid to my uh, valve, I use some NPT to AN fittings with some quarter inch uh, bent aluminum tube uh, just to connect the two up. Uh, the tube is just bent with a little uh, tube bending tool and then I have to flare the ends to trap the nut and the sleeve on the end. This connects everything up to the pneumatic valve. Uh, I connected two solenoids up so I can open and close the pneumatic valve. And then I just uh, grabbed my lab bench power supply and I started uh, toggling away the solenoids. That's pretty cool. And it looks like everything's moving great. Uh, the valve opens and closes on time. It's working really well. And uh, this is a super exciting moment because this is the first like real part of the rocket engine coming together. I have a whole bunch of other hardware that's kind of slowly trickled in over the past couple of months and I'm starting to put it together. I think the next thing I'm gonna be doing is working on the uh, tank delta qualification to test it to a higher pressure. Uh, so if you remember a few episodes back, I was working on some kegs uh, that I was going to turn into my stainless steel tanks for the rocket engine. 
And so I just have to do some hydrostatic testing to make sure that all of that works. After I've done that, then I can uh, connect the tanks up to the main propellant valves and we can start moving some fluids around at high pressures. Uh, and then after that, we can worry about getting a structure to bolt everything together and start working on the control system. If you'd like to watch me continue my efforts to build rocket engines of all shapes and sizes, uh, it'd really mean a lot to me if you click the subscribe button. And if you're already subscribed, if you leave a comment or add a like to this video, that helps the YouTube algorithm imagine that people want to watch this. In any case, though, thank you so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you on the next episode of Liquid Rocket Engines.